in free trade area. Any sort of single you see is, is marginal. It seems the kind of the EU is sort of a very strange mix between, as you said, slightly left of centre, not radically, slightly left of centre social politics with uh, quite far to the right neoliberal economics. It's, it seems to be a strange mix, and I think the economics of the EU has moved more to the right over time. Would you agree with that? I think what you mean by neoliberal economics there is just free movement. So free movement of labour means that you you can move to get the best paid job that, that's available on the whole of the continent. Free movement of capital means that you that you can move your money to pay the lowest tax that that is available on the on the whole of the continent. So to that extent free movement, because of the incentives it provides for individual countries to implement low taxes, is neoliberal. But I'm not sure the the European Union is neoliberal by construction. Free movement principles are are, are quite there's something sort of egalitarian about certainly about free movement of labour. So I'm not sure about really neoliberal. I'm not sure it's a very neoliberal political institution. It might have that effect because of the incentives it provides them. Okay. Um, just to throw a last wee question into you. I don't know if you saw yesterday about the UK's guarantee of the debt. Uh, how do you think this um, influences things? Is it is it a bit of spin on both sides or is... is does it have serious consequences? I think it was always the case. If you had looked at these issues before, I, I would have taken it almost implicitly that the, the UK was wanting to make a move like uh, guaranteeing current UK debt. The issue, effectively, is to do with the position that the UK government have set out in their their legal advice, presumably, tells them that, that, that this is a likely scenario. What they want to be viewed as is the continuing state. So the, if Scotland votes for independence, it's not going to be the case that the UK splits into Scotland and the rest of the UK. What, what it's going to be is that uh, Scotland secedes from the UK and the UK continues to exist. This seems a bit odd to me, but I'm not a lawyer, so I, I, I can't really comment. But the, the sort of logical consequence of that is that the debts issued by the UK government historically are still debts of, of the continuing UK. So that's all that the, the Treasury's done. It said that it won't divide the debt. It won't say Scotland's due an 8.4 population share of the UK debt. It's, all this debt will be UK debt and the negotiations that Scotland and the rest of the UK have following a yes vote would be about how Scotland reimburses the UK for, for retaining that debt and the UK would retain that debt. There was a couple of interesting points, I thought, about what was said yesterday. Alex Salmon was on Good Morning Scotland and he said that the payments that the Scottish government would make to the UK government to service this debt would be based on the current payments as they they are due to international markets. So if there's a a coupon payment or a redemption payment due, Scotland would pay its 8.4% share of that payment. Whereas what the UK Treasury paper said was that some value would be assessed of Scotland's share and Scotland would have to raise money on the international markets and buy out its share at a point in time. So these are clearly very different uh, different uh, funding mechanisms that the UK and Scottish governments envisage for Scotland taking on its fair share of debt which was not really picked up, I thought, in the media. The media was, were focusing on the sort of strategic implications. Does the fact that uh, the UK government have said that they're guaranteeing the debt have implications for these negotiations? Is it a, is it a, a strategic mistake? But I don't really view it as that. It, it was obvious. It was a logical consequence of the UK wanting to claim successor state status. Um, and the idea of uh, buying it back on the international markets, is that a logical choice of uh, taking economic independence? I think both both the positions of the respective governments are, are a possibility. So Scotland could have a, a sort of bilateral uh, loan ar- arrangement with the, with the rest of the UK, where the rest of the UK is paying international markets for the UK debt and Scotland is making payments to the UK government based on some loan schedule which is related to the terms of the bonds that have been issued. Alternatively, the just putting a value in Scotland's share and, and the UK government saying, well, 
you owe us £100 billion to buy out your share and Scotland having to, the, to then raise £100 billion on the international markets in order to buy this out is also a sort of logical uh, position. It will almost certainly be cheaper for Scottish taxpayers to go with the one that has been proposed by uh, the Scottish government than it will be for the one that's proposed by the UK government. But why is that? Which, because Scotland going to the markets with a request for £100 billion of, of loans will, I mean, it's the same as uh, if you go to the supermarket for a tin of beans you and you know before you go that the tin, a tin of beans costs 50 pence. You don't expect the fact that you've gone to the supermarket to mean that the supermarket is going to put up the price. But if you go to the to the supermarket distribution network and say, I want to buy 500 million tins of beans, you can probably expect some price response as well. So Scotland going to the international markets with a request to raise 100 billion pounds will make it expensive for Scotland to raise that money. Whereas if Scotland goes to, if Scotland just says to the UK government, our taxes would have funded this amount anyway of the UK debt, and that's we'll continue this arrangement, then there are no sort of a, there's no change there in the current funding costs to Scottish taxpayers. The final, the final thing. Sorry, can I just ask you one question about the currency issue? Yeah. Um, the way that it's often portrayed from different sides is that. If Scotland chooses to have its own currency, it would be a very hard currency, and it would make for a diff, uh, di- because of the oil money and uh, different factors, it, it would make it very difficult for Scotland to attract tourism at the prices it would be. But if we stay with the pound, there wouldn't necessarily be a massive amount of ec- economic control, and if we went with the euro, there would be even less economic control. Are these kind of three things that we hear quite often? Too simplistic, or is it a fair representation of what the situation might be with the different possibilities? I'm not sure about the hard currency issue. This seems to be predicated on the sort of gross value of North Sea oil. But you've got to think about where the money for the the, the payments to North Sea oil actually go. If we take the figures that uh, UK oil and gas have produced, which I think are a bit too gross, but uh, let, let's go with their figures. They, they, they've talked about £40 billion pounds is the value of activity in the North Sea. The tax take, which goes to the UK government at the moment, is about is less than £10 billion, It's about £10 billion, possibly a bit less. The other payments will be wages to the people who work there, which is maybe 50-50 based in Scotland, maybe 50-50 based elsewhere. And the other payment that is made is profits. And these profits are owned by international markets. So they are sent all over the world, maybe predominantly in the UK, but certainly not predominantly in Scotland relative to to the rest of the UK. So if Scotland had its own currency and it had this geographical share of North Sea oil, the value of this North Sea oil to the Scottish economy is not the 40 billion. The value of, the, the, of North Sea oil is the tax, so maybe £10 billion, plus the wages that are paid to people in Scotland and a very small per- percentage share of the profits. I think the hard currency issue is kind of oversold because this money is sent south of the border, it's sent internationally in terms of profits. So it's not going to be the case that when the oil price goes up in Scotland, that makes everybody in Scotland really, really wealthy. If the go- I mean, the government has uh, talked about setting up two oil funds, one to manage the volatility of uh, year-to-year fluctuations in the oil price and one to provide a sort of savings fund for future generations. I'm sort of sceptical about the savings fund for future generations one, given the budgetary situation in Scotland and in the UK. The one to manage year-to-year volatility is very sensible. And what you would do for that one is that if the oil price went up, you would probably invest some of your money abroad. You would you would get money into that fund and that fund would buy international assets, which means that the Scottish economy wouldn't overheat. It's not like the Scottish government would say, oh, we're going to spend massive amounts on public services because the oil, because the oil price is high. It should be taking a sort of long term view of the, the oil price and smoothing these uh, these fluctuations. So I'm not I'm not convinced that the Scottish currency would be a particularly massively hard currency. I think it could probably maintain parity with the UK sterling. The issue with a currency union, 
the all the points about this be, this being beneficial in trade terms between Scotland and for, for Scotland and for the rest of the UK are, are true, but the issue that makes a, a currency union between Scotland and the UK sort of less. I mean, very desirable from Scotland's point of view and less desirable from the rest of the UK's point of view is the insurance issue that is implicit in uh, in currency unions. So if Scotland, if the Scottish public sector needs to be bailed out by the central bank of this currency union, then the funding for that is spread across the whole union and Scot- Scotland essentially pays a tenth of its own bailout co- costs. If the rest of the UK government gets into trouble and needs bailed out, then it has to pay nine-tenths of its own bailout costs, which means that the incentives for Scotland to get into trouble are, are much greater than the incentives for the rest of the UK to get into trouble. And this is an issue called moral hazard, which uh, means that the rest of the UK might see a currency union as not in its interests, even though there are some trade benefits for the rest of the UK sharing a, a currency. This may mean that the pronouncements on a currency union, whilst it's true that there are trade benefits, are, I think these negotiations are going to be more difficult than, than is claimed by the SNP and the White Paper. The other option that you mentioned was the Eurozone. The Eurozone, I'm not sure, can be taken as given at the moment. The Eurozone is in a period of flux. They have discovered that their institutions weren't adequate and the process of reform of these institutions will have to go on and they're not there yet with that. In the long run, it's actually a much more logical place for Scotland to be because there are a mixture of small countries and large countries in the Eurozone and I sort of see the Eurozone as a better long-term place for Scotland to be than a sterling union. Clearly, in the short run, you don't want to join the EU, the Eurozone because its institutions are not of a suitable design yet. But over over the course of a long time, probably, these these presumably will get sorted. Yeah, is there moves afoot to, to reform them? Uh, yeah, they're sort of stumbling from one uh, problem to another. I mean, the issue with a currency union is that you've got to decide before a crisis occurs how this crisis will be funded who will bear the losses and that ex ante agreement had not been made in the case of the eurozone so when the crisis arrived you're having to allocate these losses ex post and uh, that's clearly a difficult thing to do so once the once these losses from the financial crisis in the eurozone have been cleared then you can make a new ex ante agreement and then the, the, the issue of how to bear future losses can be discussed in, in, w- without a, an eye to how the current losses are being allocated. OK, and can we finish up just with one tiny little thing? Because now that I've got a professional economist on the line, I would never forgive myself if I didn't ask this very short, very direct question. Is austerity just a transfer of wealth from the poor to the rich? That's a good question. The aim of austerity is to balance taxes and uh, public spending. So austerity can be implemented in two ways. Austerity, you could cut public spending, which, given the recipients of public spending, is likely to be a transfer from the poor to the rich. But austerity could also be implemented by raising taxes, and in which case, and given the likely incidence of taxes, austerity in that case could be a, a transfer from uh, the rich to the poor. The balance between raising taxes and cutting spending is a political decision and you can possibly make your own judgments about the political colour of and the consequent uh, uh, balance that has been chosen for the UK uh, in terms of the balance between raising taxes and cutting spending. Thank you very much for coming on, David. I thought you've negotiated this particular minefield expertly. (laughs) Possibly. Thanks for having me. Well, there you go. That was David Comerford. I hope you enjoyed that. There's certainly a lot to chew on in there. Um, just a couple of little announcements before we go this time. I'd just like to say thank you to the people that sent us a little donation. It's uh, greatly appreciated. I'm recording a couple more this week, so there's lots more coming up. Some very interesting guests, I can assure you. As usual on the podcast, the guest gets to choose the tune, and David chose this one. So I'll speak to you next time. The men of the north are rocking gain. They're all getting together, all. Oh. 
the derricks rise to the northern skies and the past has gained for a barrow.